What up, ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Warden here. Today we're gonna to talk about Fun with Folktale. It is a functional programming library for JavaScript. <laughs> programming, gaming, fitness, Jesse Warden. So why Folktale? Well, it models functional programming concepts in JavaScript. So anything from functional programming languages such as Haskell, Camel, Elixir, Erlang, Rust, all those good places, good functional languages have really good ideas from the mathematicians. The developers of Folktale have brought it over. So it has less runtime exceptions or it's more informative as to why. It's kind of the, one of the reasons you want to use it is that you don't want to have random explosions that you didn't expect. If you knew about the exceptions and you actually catch them, that's different. It's These are the ones where you get a undefined is not a function or something that you wrote explodes and you didn't mean for it to. And if you do get errors, you can actually create these kind of things in such a way as you know why they actually threw. It likes to avoid the null and undefined. So these are keywords in JavaScript that both mean a semblance of nothing. Null is intentionally used by some developers to say, I meant for this to be nothing. Whereas undefined is, it's not actually there defined at all, and it doesn't represent it's actually being there. But it's very ambiguous in certain contexts, and each one together is also very amb ambiguous what you mean when you say null or nothing, right? It's not always very clear what that is. Now, when you hear people say correct in functional programming, what they mean by correct is it means like algebra, the equations are incorrect or correct. And in algebra, that's one of the things I liked about math is that algebra seemed something that I could easily prove on like geometry where you use postulates and theorems. Algebra felt very real world. I saw it in carpentry with my dad. And so I really liked how if I could start making my code that way, where I could prove it was correct or not with unit tests, and I don't have to say, well, I have re unit tests, but I still don't know if it works, right? That kind of stuff I didn't like. So when you use Folktale is when you're using just JavaScript, especially in Node, but also ES6 in the browser too, that's fine. Or ES5, doesn't really matter. The point is, is that you're using raw JavaScript. So if you're using something like Elm, or Dart, or PureScript, or ClojureScript, you already have a lot of these concepts in there. Dart, not so much, but you can still add those in. But Elm already has a lot of the functional concepts built in. PureScript, definitely so, bars a lot of ideas from Haskell, as well as Clojure as well. So if you're just doing JavaScript, you want to use a library to use these functional concepts without having to set up a compiler chain or a completely different way of working, you know, very similar to Lodash, you borrow some of its functions. It's a very, very similar way. Now, TypeScript is currently not supported in terms of that. You can use it, but you don't all have a lot of type definitions. It's just the ones that are in there from the docs. Quill, one of the maintainers, wants to definitely add TypeScript in there. TypeScript has some amazing support for union types, and, and it's a compiler in general. It can find a lot of bugs that functional programming typically finds at runtime. So TypeScript is definitely in the works. It's just a, a big library. It's a lot of work. So... I believe that Folktale puts the fun in functional programming. I've been programming for 17 years, and I haven't felt this stupid <laughs> in a long time, since 2003. So it's it's felt really good to, for the past 18 months, do programming and just, you know, feel like I'm a kid again. I'm learning something brand new. A lot of the things I thought I knew, I'm unlearning. I'm relearning a lot of things. Very, very challenging, and it's fun. Uh, the fact that I'm not that good yet, and the more I learn, the less I think I've been coding functionally, the fact that it's that fun shows you how cool Folktale is, and that even if you don't know a lot about functional programming, you can see how fun it is. It really benefits you, and so that's that's why I think it puts the fun in functional programming. So the four things we're going to talk about from that library, it has a lot of functionality, but the four things we're going to talk about is maybe predicates and checkers versus validators, union types, and tasks. So when do you use them? Well, maybe is a value or it's either there or not. So maybe is when you may have a result of a function, like I'm looking at an array for an item. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. I don't know. It's very clear that it's there or not. Uh, validator is when you have user input. So people are typing into a text field, into some kind of form that you're doing for an application. Or if you're a server-side developer doing with APIs, this is validating your inputs. Or if you're reading file data from either the server or client trying to validate, is that legit or not? And if not, why not? Now, union types are just another useful data type. JavaScript really doesn't have support for those kind of things like other programming languages. So she's created one for us, Quill. And tasks 
are enhancement on promises. They, they act just like promises, but they have two key features that it doesn't have. So in practice, what that really means is anytime you're going to use non undefined, you're probably going to use a maybe at a bare minimum. You can use it for a lot of other things such as IO, rest calls, things like that. But at the bare minimum, if you see null or undefined, you should start thinking about using a maybe to be very clear that you're returning nothing versus null, which you might didn't detect or didn't expect or undefined, things like that. Validators is for validating the user input and sanitizing any kind of server input, as well as nice error messages for yourself as the developer of your own code, for consumers of your library, or if you're building front end, for users actually inputting values and fields in your app, these error messages can be displayed to the user as to why what they're inputting isn't correct or working. And if you're using no one defined as a re legit return value, sometimes that's a good indication you should use a union type, that if I'm not gonna return uh, some kind of class or object, then I can return a union type that has a very definition. It could be one of many things, such as nothing or the lack of a value. If a bunch of things can be returned from a function, a union type is definitely something you should check out. TypeScript already has pretty good support for this for multiple return types. And so union types are a great way to return one single thing that can actually exist in multiple states at the same time. Very similar to electrons and quantum mechanics. In practice, tasks are enhanced promises. What that means is you can cancel them, and they have cleanup code if you're dealing with things like database connections or socket connections, things like that. Promises typically represent a value or an immutable value that you can always get out no matter you know, how many references you have to that particular promise. So this allows you to have that cleanup code centralized. And you can easily convert back to a promise you know, if you need to. So you can start using tasks and then very easily opt out. All right, so let's talk about using the maybe data type. The maybe data type from the documentation is a data structure that models the presence or absence of a value. So this is why no one likes functional programming if you don't have a mathematician degree, because what does that mean? I don't know. What it really means is that if I have anything that's not null or defined, it's going to go in this just function right here. It means I have this value and it's right here. And so if I call any function, and again, this... Uh, has the caveat, okay, that you understand pure functions, why they're valuable, and you understand immutable data. If you do not, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this won't make sense, and that's okay. Just understand that it, all functions are supposed to take the same inputs and return the same outputs. And the only way to guarantee that with things like null and defined is you can say, well, nothing. So you explicitly call out nothing. And what that means is that if I get a value, I'm going to put it in just, like a string, a number, an object I found in an array. Those are all fantastic things. But if I don't find that value, if I call the server and it responds with an error, if I try to log in and that user isn't found, I'm going to return nothing. So that's the difference between a very explicit just and a very explicit nothing. So let's give an example of an array locally that has, for whatever reason, a undefined as the second item. So I have this get user at index function, and what it allows me to do is pass in an index, and in that user array, I return that index. So I can abstract this function away. The actual user's array could not be a publicly exposed function in this module. It's kind of a way to have private data, or maybe it comes from a server. Now you'll notice if I pass in one, it gives me Albus as an object back, and that's fantastic. But if I pass in two, it gives me undefined. Now what does that mean? Does it mean it didn't find an item at the index? Does it mean it found an item at the index and it was undefined? Or does it mean that the data is wrong and I need to clean up the data and undefined was correct, but I actually need to clean up the data and then rerun this function again? Those are just three of the reasons why undefined is a horrible data type in terms of returning from functions. I don't know why it's undefined and what undefined means. Did it not find it or what? So this is where you would use maybe to change it and say, all right, if it is some type of value, if it's truthy, if you say users index and you just imply that in an if statement, like this refactored function here, then that means it's truthy or true, and say, cool, we found something. So go ahead and put it inside of the maybe.just and return that. Otherwise, using the ternary if syntax on two lines, go ahead and return nothing, and it's a very explicit now, you can always call this function and always get a value back, called a maybe. And that maybe is either a just with a value in it or nothing. And so it's very clear that the internals of the function will figure out if it's supposed to be undefined or not. Let's give you a higher level example. If you're using array comprehensions, they're a lot easier to work with in terms of for loops because they're pure and they take collections and they return values and sometimes immutable, they don't throw. There's a lot of good things about them. But they're also a little bit more complicated because you're no longer looking for 
items. You're now passing predicates or passing higher order functions to these things and letting them do some work. So sometimes it's not very clear where things are breaking down. Is it your data? Is it the predicate? Is it the actual array comprehension I use? Maybe I should use find index instead of find. So here we have find user by name. And in this array, we're going to say, all right, if we have a user, it's truthy, right? So it's not undefined or null. And that actual object we found has a name property that equals what we pass in. Great. Go ahead and return it. Now, dot, the find function in Lodash returns an undefined if it doesn't find it. So if you look at the bottom there, I have find user by name. I pass in Jesse. It gives us an object. That's fantastic. But if I pass in Bruce, it's undefined. Does that mean that didn't find it, or does that mean it's in there, but the predicate's wrong? It's also very unclear what that means. So this is very, very subtle, but again, it's not clear if maybe it did find it, but the data was undefined, it maybe came back or something, we're not really sure. So simply by refactoring this, we can say if it's not nil, in terms of null or undefined, then we didn't find anything. So we are very explicit, like, hey, we didn't find anything, we're legit. So even with array comprehensions, you can still use maybes to be very explicit in what you're returning. So that this find by username could be a pure function. It will always return a value, in this case, maybe. And it'll always be either maybe or just. And just can be whatever that data is. So we'd have these maybes. We have these constructs. They're a union type to represent the absence of a value or a value being there. But wh what if we need the data out of it? How do we actually get it? So if you look at the bottom... It's like our example before. We've added this thing called get or else. And it's very similar to the get in Lodash. What that means is if we get a value, cool, go ahead and give it to me. And so instead of the maybe now, you'll notice it's printing out the actual object it found. In this case, name Albus in the age of two. But if it's not found or undefined, in this case, maybe nothing, you'll notice that the second one that calls it this, the two, it says no value found at index. So not only does the maybe say nothing, but we can actually provide a substitute data type. So if we get from that maybe, we can say either give me the value or give me this default value. And as you'll see in a future slide, that actually works very well for reading local config files, things like that where it's okay if it's not there, you have a default fallback. So let's, if you're not familiar with get, I'm going to show you how, why this is pretty important. So we have an object here, not an array, an object with keys as strings for the name of those objects. So Jesse has a key as his name, and the object is his age and the skills that he has. Same with Albus and Cal. So if you use lodash get, you can do something very cool with that second parameter. It doesn't have to be one word. It could be a dot dot. It could be an array axis indexer, and it can be dot, 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 all the way down. So it could be a very deeply nested object. It'll figure it out, and if it doesn't work, or it throws an exception, or that property doesn't exist, instead of undefined is not a function, or blah, 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 or property doesn't exist, instead, it'll give you the third parameter as the default. If it does find a value, it'll go ahead and give you that. So it's a nice, safe way to do that. Now, you'll notice here, I'm only using users by itself, right? And so if I say users, it gives me the actual value it found. It's the same thing as going users.albus. And the second one, I say get users brandy. She's not there, so it go, gives me the third default parameter. Now that's okay, but dotting in JavaScript usually is okay. Where you get into trouble is where you dot dot. So because users brandy is undefined, if I go user brandy dot age, I get in trouble and it throws. Throw and errors in general are bad for a bunch of reasons, two of which are A, it doesn't return a value because the function broke. Two, we don't know what other functions it broke, so it could mess up your entire program. And so those kind of things, we then have to go fix the bug and then rerun our code, which is really bad. And then users who are using it, either on the front end, their stuff is broken, maybe. And on the back end, it could cause data loss. It's really, really bad. So what we do is you say, all right, from users, get brandy.age as a string. And Lodash figures out how to get it, right? And if it doesn't find it, instead of throwing, it says, hey, I couldn't find it. So that is why we use get. And that's why, going back to this syntax, the getter out on the bottom is very, very important. All right, so you get the getter else, that's how you get data values out, or a default if they're not there. Let's talk about pattern matching as another way to get values out or to match against which one it is. So you can do some logic instead of getting data out, you can actually do a function. Get is cool to give you data, but pattern this match with function here will allow you to do things. You can pass in a function. So if, you've, if you're familiar with Elixir or Erlang, this should look very familiar to their match syntax where if I have a just, it's going to run the just function and log that out. If I have a nothing, it's going to run the error where it's going to log that error out. Now you'll notice that I've created a maybe.just here on purpose, and so it's going to log out the just because it matches with the just. 
if you think of this like a switch statement, it should look very, very similar. Where just would be case, just nothing would be case, nothing, right? There is no default. So be aware that if you don't list these things, you'll get an error if they don't match. Now, the second example is I have a maybe nothing. And so you'll notice that it doesn't match with the just. And at the very bottom, it logs out nothing, bra, because it matches with the nothing. So maybe just with a value and it matches with the first one. Like Think of like a switch statement. And maybe nothing branches at the bottom. Then you'll also notice that there's that underscore is the first parameter for nothing. That's another way to indicate a function or error function in JavaScript with no parameters. Now, you'll, it looks like I'm, I'm passing a single parameter or arguments to that function as lodash, but actually it's, it represents kind of like a whole or I don't care, right? So you don't really care about that value. So it's also a cheat way to not have to write two parentheses. You can just write the underscore and say, oh, it doesn't have any parameters. If it does, I don't really care. All right, so let's show you how because match with is also a pure function, it returns values. So I'm actually going to set the return value up here of result to whatever match with returns. If it matches with just, which this one does, then it's going to return true. If it matches with nothing, it's going to return false. And notice since we created maybe.just, this match with function is returning true. So whatever you turn from those error functions is what is actually going to get a variable. And this makes it really, really easy to unit test these things. You see, expect this match with to be true or false. All right, so that's the basics of maybe. One way to use it to learn, if a lot of this stuff is very advanced for you, is anytime you're doing I.O., like reading files or HTTP, you know, AJAX calls or parsing data, things outside your program, maybes are great because maybe it'll work or not. <laughs> if nothing, then it didn't work. So give an example. Read config in this case. If the file's there, it'll give you back a buffer that kind of looks like this. But if the file is not there, then it'll throw an error. If you the file's there, but it has a permission error, it'll throw a different type of error. And you'll notice in the older Python days and some of the Java world, they would actually detect which type of error it was based on a throwable keyword or just in Python reading the documentation and responding to each error in turn. Sometimes you could react to those errors and do things. In this case in JavaScript, if we can't read the config, we're in trouble. We need that config. Uh, uh, we need to know if it's not there to use a reasonable default. But because this is I.O. or a side effect, we can't control this. So what you do is you wrap it with a maybe. So we're going to say if we can read this file and we can convert it to UTF-8 string to make sure the format's correct, and it goes through a JSON parse successfully, reading that JSON, then we can return the maybe result. If none of those things work, it's going to catch the error and return nothing. So this is a really basic way of wrapping core functionality to guarantee that reading side effect type of operations always succeeds. Wrap it in a try catch. Make sure the just that you're returning is after all the things that could possibly explode, right? So don't do them on one line. The two lines here is good. And then returning that. And that way, if you're reading a local config, if it's there, I'm going to go ahead and get the first one, which is chicken moo cow. That's the JSON actually in the config. Otherwise, I'm going to get the default path that I provided if the file isn't there or it has permission or whatever else. All right, so let's talk about validator. Validators are kind of like, they started with predicates. This is my gateway into functional programming. And if you're looking how, you know, what's the easiest way I can get into functional programming, even before I'm ready for folktale, validators are definitely it. So predicates are any function, regardless of programming language, that returns true or false. Things that are good examples of that are is string and lodash. Uh, sum, which takes a bunch of functions and says as long as at least one of these functions returns true, the whole sum returns true. And valid credit card. It is a predicate that I borrowed from Square's online credit card JavaScript library, wrote some unit tests around it, and call it valid credit card. So I can pass it a number and verify that that number matches against all the known credit card formats, such as Visa, American Express, and things like that. And it's easiest to make pure and no side effects because you can basically use low-level predicates to make sure that no matter what data type you throw of it, it never throws. And you can use things like Lodash and some of the lower-level things in JavaScript to verify if these data types are legit and verify a bunch of different values against things. And using Lodash Git, you can also make sure that if you're validating larger objects, that those also don't throw. So give an example. Here's a non-empty string predicate. We want to verify that whatever we pass in, this O parameter here, this O variable, is it a string? And if it is a string, we know that it has a length property. Make sure the length is greater than zero. If it's something like a number or some other object that doesn't have a length property, don't even bother to run the o.length and short circuit. That's why they do and and. 
So things like cow would work, but using a blank string or a blank tempest string, uh, one, two, three, or new date would always return false. And notice that it doesn't ever throw. There's no errors because we use the built-in battle-hardened Lodash's string to make sure that it never throws, regardless of browser, regardless of you know what node version. Taking a step further, legit number. Is it a number and it's not NAN? Not a number is actually a number. So we want to make sure it's false. So one works, 2.34 as a float works, 10 divided by zero is fine, but number infinity divided by zero is not. And legit date is even worse. You can create a new date as you look in the very, very bottom there with new cow, and it doesn't throw. It's completely fine with giving you that date. But if you were to use its methods, you get NAN, and if you print out two string, it says invalidate. So these are where you build basic predicates on compose them together. So we're composing Lodash's functions in here to make it even better. So the validators, you take those predicates and you add an error message to it. So if it returns false, why? Why did it return false? Well, it's not a string, bro, or it's not a legit number. It's a number, but it's NAN. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for legitimate numbers that we can use here. So in the olden days, the way I learned it was you take a function and add this property called error message on it as a string. And so you can localize it and things like that. And the point was, if the function ever returned false, you could easily look at the function and look at the error message property and see why it would return false. So if you're doing a lot of these functions together using lodash sum or things like that, it's very easy to get a list of reasons as to why a higher level object like an OAuth token or a database record or you know some kind of JSON config file, why was it wrong? Well, here are the following predicates that failed on it. And here's the following error message is written in English. So very, very helpful stuff, but a lot of work to wrap those basic concepts and hard to compose them. So here's an example of how you can use Folktale to actually start building your own validators, which are a lot easier to compose. So we have that new empty string predicate you saw earlier. But we have this new ternary if statement where you have valid string. And what this function does is it takes that predicate and says, if it's successful, we're going to return a success or a validator.success. And it takes the item that we said was successful. Otherwise, if it's a failure, we return an array, and that array is that error string I was talking about before. But notice it's an array inside a failure, not a single string item. And the reason for that is that as you add these failures and together with other failures, they start adding to that array, and you can have a list of failures as to why things are breaking or why things are not validating correctly. So in this case, validation of cow gives you back a success. If you validate an empty string or one, two, three, it tells you that they're not a valid string. It's got to be not empty and a string. And so let's show you uh, real quick. I wrap it because I didn't like this ternary syntax. So I created a simple helper function called validator. And it says, all right, here's the error string. And the second parameter is the predicate. And so that way you can wrap that weird ternary syntax. So instead of writing three lines of code, you can write it in one. So a normal project where you're validating a larger object, you would have a bunch of predicates up here such as legit string, number, date, et cetera. In this case, we're building a bunch of predicates to validate an OAuth token, okay, which has three properties, but we want to validate, you know, it's a date, it's a string, it's spelled correctly, blah, blah, blah. And then at the bottom, we create folktale validators around that, using my wrapper function. So if it's not a string, it's going to return this. Otherwise, it's a legit string. So let's give you an example of validating with that particular token. At the top is an OAuth token. Now, normally an OAuth access token would be called the bearer, and this is what you put in the header of your request with the JSON web token. And that's typically a big, long string of numbers and symbols and letters. In our case, we made it pretty small, so it'd fit on the slide. The issued at is the date that the token was issued at. Now, all these properties aren't guaranteed. These are just the ones that I was dealing with at work. And it's issued at is basically the milliseconds since epoch of when that date was created. So you can take those numbers, create a new date, and that's when it is. It includes the time zone and everything else. Expires in is typically, in this case, days. So when it, whenever it was issued at, based on the date that this current code is running on, it expires in two days. So you can detect if the token is still valid or not. But before we even do that, we need to make sure this object is legit. It's coming from some random server and code that I didn't write in a completely different language. So we want to validate it. So we start with the success. And we use this thing called concat. If you ever looked at array.concat, it's very, uh, very similar. You're basically concatting together values into a growing array. Hopefully, that array is empty, and it's a successful token, right? So this token up here, it matches all the correct things. It's got a legit access token. The string is correct. It's longer than an empty string. Issued at is actually a number that's not you know, NAN. 
and you can turn it into a date. Expires in is also a number, and it's legit as well. So we've concatted all these validators together that know how to access a token, look at the properties, and verify they're legit. The access token validator, the expires in, and the issued at, right? We're verifying each one. All these together verify the token. And they notice they take the token as the first parameter, not the, pro the properties. So we let these validators figure out how to get at the properties in the token, probably using Lodash Git. This one's successful, so it actually returns th this whole list here of success doc and cat and cat returns a successful validation. But let's go ahead and change the expires in to a string of two. Notice now when I actually can cat them together, I'm going to get a failure, and that's because the second validator expires in is going to say it's invalid. And the reason it's invalid is because expires in is supposed to be a number. Now that error message isn't that great, but I made it fit on the slide. What it should say is it's supposed to be an integer in representing days, and it looks like a string. So that would be a really, really nice error message. Notice access token and issued at, they passed just fine. But because one in the entire chain failed, instead of getting success back, we got a failure, and it includes the failures that went wrong. So let's break date as well. Now we're going to get two failures back. So we're going to get one failure message, but that array is going to actually have two error messages within it. So again, if you wrap success concat 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 into a function and say call it validate token, it's always going to return a validator. It's not going to throw. It's going to take whatever you give it and let you know, hey, look, this thing is legit or not. And if it's not, it'll tell you why not, which is extremely helpful for any function in a language where you're not using TypeScript or you're running at runtime without something like Dart, where Dart actually has runtime exceptions built in if you're not doing production mode. So this kind of stuff is extremely, extremely helpful. So here's an example of what I'm talking about where you wrap it with a function. So you say, did it validate? I just let me know. So I, I'm, I'm missing the arrow at the top, but you get the point where I say, if this variable, did it validate, is true or false based on the match with. So if it's successful, did it validate is going to equal true. If it's a failure, it's going to equal false. And so you can see at the bottom, it equals false because we messed up the token so much. All right, so that's validators. Let's talk about union types. Union types are a different type of data. They're a different type of way of modeling data. They're another type of making variables. So for example, scholars we're all familiar with. They're one atomic value, like a string of cow or one or number or true is a boolean. It's one value all the time, and it's very easy to say that that's the state that it's currently in. A product is very similar to the product in multiplication, where you have two independent values that equal something greater. So for example, the name of Jesse and the age of 38 is a number exist in this object. And in our domain, we're going to say people or persons from the database are represented this way. They have a name property as a string and an age as a number. And we put them as some objects and we have a list of people. When I say that, other developers on my team know what I'm talking about. And we can you know, write validators against this kind of stuff. And in other languages, they have classes. You can do that as well. So we have a class with a person and it has a public name property and a public age uh, property as well and methods to access those things and format those, etc. So when you have two of these things coexisting, that's what a product is. A union is one step above that. It's basically one out of many concepts at any time. So for example, if you read a file, it could be one of the following three, an error, a permission error, or the file's contents. There's no data type that represents that. It actually gives you three different things back. And two of the first ones actually doesn't give you back. It just breaks the function. Now, if you try to catch those, you could actually return a custom error back, right? Typically, you throw errors, but you can return them if you wanted to or just wrap it in your own custom thing. But even so, that's three different types of objects. That's not one type, which is what we call a union. Another example is accessing RESTify headers. It's either there or it's not, but it's bad value, or it's there but it has no value, or here's the default value. So we have four different states here, or five in some cases, that it could be what is a type that could represent that, like five different classes that are actually one class, like is this inheritance, how does this work? So that's where unions come in. So you already dealt with unions in this presentation. You've already seen maybe. It's basically the union type function. You pass in a string of what you want to call it, and then you have an object which defines the variance. So maybe can either be a just maybe or it can be a nothing maybe. And if it's a just, it takes a value in there and stores it internally. If somebody asks for what that is, we're going to give them the object with the value in it. If it's nothing, we're going to give them this empty object back, which means it's nothing. And the reason we wrap it in objects is because internally it kind of treats them like an iterable. So just you don't have to call it value, but you should always have some kind of object representing the return value. in. So this is your basic union type.
to use it, it's very similar to before. You can create it just like any other data type called maybe.just and pass your values in. If you print that out, it's going to say value cal. And uh, in this case, you notice that I didn't wrap the value with object destruction. It's actually returning the raw value. It, unfortunately, because of the iterable, it makes it spaghetti. So if you log it out, it looks like that. It takes each character in a string. So this is why you kind of wrap it into value. And again, it doesn't have to be value. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it name or whatever. And you can also treat them like variables. So I have maybe cow, which is a constant that represents maybe just cow. And I can match with against that maybe cow some variable dynamically and see if it's if it's a value, great, return it. Otherwise, if it's nothing, return false. And you'll notice in this case, it returns cow because I created a just cow. And the matching works correctly. And in this case, I do the exact same code, except I change it to a nothing. The match with now returns with false. So it's very similar to maybe, but in this case, this is our custom one. You could make whatever you want with as many variants as you want. This only has two variants, just a nothing. A bigger one would be like HTTP method, where we know we're going to have the main six of get, post, put, delete, patch, and options. They're not dynamic, right? So they're always going to return that hard-coded string. But the good news is, is that we have a way to know if I ask what HTTP method is this server, it can be a union type. It can be one of these six at any given time, right, based on that request. And it also has some form of reflection. It uses object prototype internally. So you can say has instance. That'll work with both HTTP method as well as the variants, in this case, get. The variants themselves, such as get and post, have the ability to do has instance as well. So they can match against themselves and not match at the very bottom against themselves. So for example, post is not the same as a get, but they both are included in HTTP method. Now, if you want to do equality actually on the values themselves, you use this thing called derive equality. It's very similar to object prototype, adding a method to it and all your instances, but it's not exactly the same. It's more of a function that makes that happen. But it results in kind of like the same thing. So to give an example, if we equal HP get against HP get, it's going to be true because effectively they are the same. Yes, they're different instances, but do they equal each other? Yes, absolutely. Get is always a get is always a get. And the same thing if I create a new A and B variable, they're going to equal each other because they're both a get, right? So let's do something a little more dynamic. If we have an attack, it actually takes two variables, one of them optional. It takes an amount of if you hit somebody, and if you did, was it a critical hit or not? Otherwise, you, you miss them, and it returns a hard-coded value, miss. So the instances, if you look at the first two examples, they both have an instance of hit. They both match each other. But the hit of false equals the hit of one because the data in it, within it also matches. So that's why it's true, that number three example there. Number four is false because the damage or the amount variable is different where even though the critical is also different as well. So those will not equal. So that's how you can equal and verify that these variants actually don't equal each other if they have dynamic data internally. So that is union types. Let's talk about tasks, which are the enhanced promise. So there's a lot more to tasks. I'm going to give you the short and dirty. And that is really just the, the cool parts about being an enhanced promise that you can cancel it and they have resource cleanup options. They work just like other promises that you can chain chain them together just like you do dot then dot then dot then here's an example that's from the docs i modified slightly you'll notice that the cleanup will actually clean up the timer id if you want to clean it up if you cancel it you don't have to but if you want to cancel you can do some cleanup there as well and do some other tasks and the good news is that these are run regardless of whether the task was successful or failed in this case resolved or rejected a promise you can't really do that, and you also can't do it either or. You have to do it both in the then and both in the reject based on that promise. In this case, the task will run those things, and you don't have to care. And it has some other helper methods, very similar if you've used Bluebird race. You'll notice at the very bottom there, it has a dot .or. It's very similar to Bluebird's promise.race, where you have two promises. So again, if you have five promises together, and one fails, and you put them all in a promise at all, the first one could break, and all the rest would break. And if they're doing database calls, they can go off on all the blue and hopefully garbage collection catches them and cleans them up. But you don't know. So these tasks give you a nice way to handle that. And from a syntax perspective, you look at the top on this token here. I use that check token validator you saw earlier, match whether it's successful or not. If it's successful, I resolve the promise. If it's failed, I reject the promise. So that's you know normal promises. On the bottom, I'm using a task to do that. And the only difference is I have this resolver keyword. And I saw resolver.resolver, resolver.reject, where up top, I actually have these two functions. So the syntax looks very, very similar. And again, if you want to pop out of these tasks, you can just use the connection called to promise to get a promise back. 
So here's an example of work where I had a lot of code and a lot of routes that I was doing by myself. I didn't have time to flatten these promises too much. But every time the Oracle connection was released, whether it succeeded or not, I called then. So I do something called a sure thing that my coworker Jason Kaiser brought up, and that is you can put these promises and promises at all and guarantee they always resolve, even with an error. You didn't inspect the result to verify if it worked or not so that you don't have to worry about your promise all breakings. The issue with that is that in this case, Oracle release, um, I need to do that all over the place. So you'll notice in the then and the catch, I'm doing the same code twice. And some of these routes were a lot longer. So I didn't want to have to clean up my database connection, whether I was sending back a 200 to the client or a 401 for my rest of APIs. So if we factor that to tasks, you'll notice that I now can do it one place inside of the actual cleanup option or cleanup function. And I don't really care if it works or not in terms of returning. I can just fire it after they've actually responded to the client. So really, really nice day to dry fire your code. It's not amazing, but it's certainly definitely, definitely helpful. And sometimes there are cases where I wanted to cancel my promises because the user stopped the search for whatever reason. So in conclusions from all of these things you've seen, the maybe in Folktale.js, it basically represents a value is there or it isn't. And it's, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. A value could be synchronous. It could be from a server. It could be IO. It's up to you. The way you think about it is anytime you're going to return a null or find, use a maybe instead and say maybe just if the data is legit or maybe nothing if you know for a fact it's not. Very, very clear on what you're doing, and these functions always return a value. It's always a maybe. You can always assert against it, and you can chain these things together as well. If you have a side effect like I.O., maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Right? Any function you can't guarantee will work, that's where you should use a maybe. And unlike promises, which act like maybes with then, dot, then and catch, um, these guys will return synchronously, unlike a promise, which is async. So validators are anytime you're validating user input or server inputs. The data is legit or not, and if not, why not? Very black and white, and if it's not legit data, give me some uh, error messages to why, or a list of error messages. But give me nice error messages, and give me fine-grained error messages. So I, as a developer, I know what's going on. As a consumer of an API, I know what's going on. And as a user, I know why my form is not working. For union types, it's just another useful data type, higher level. If no one undefined is a legit return value, sometimes the union is nice because you can very explicitly say something. So like in the case of a maybe, you said maybe not nothing. You're adding a legitimacy to that because you could return something good or you could return something nothing or return something bad. Unions are great for that when you have multiple return values. But it's also used for modeling your data, like object and classes. You model real world things and call real things around objects and classes. In JavaScript. So unions are a way to do that where it could represent multiple things from a return function. Tasks are enhanced promises, specifically around you can cancel them, have cleanup code. They easily convert back to a promise so you can wrap all your folktale code in a task and then expose them as a promise. And no one has to know you're using folktale internally. And tasks do a lot of other cool things, but that's the basics. So folktale, I believe, using even just those four basic things really puts the fun in functional programming. There's a lot of other things in there like results and they're all built on the really hardcore functional con concepts like functors and s monads and all that other stuff. It's internally, if you really want to dig in the guts, she has a lot of that good code in there as well. But the, the concepts of chain and map are all in there as well. So if you're from a functional programming background, it works as you would expect it from that perspective. But if you're learning just like I am, it's, I found it's been really, really helpful to improve my code base, develop my skills in functional programming and still have fun while doing it. So the API docs are kind of hard to get to. They're like three or four clicks from the main site. So if you go to this link that I put up here in the Folktale API docs, I'll put this in the YouTube description as well. If you go there, you'll see packages. Once you click those packages, Quill, who wrote a lot of the documentation, she's a wonderful writer, very, very effective, clean, and good examples, gives you some more commentary on what these things do, why you're using them, and some of the additional methods that I didn't cover in this video. The actual GitHub is there, and the reason that's important is that 1.0 had a lot of these libraries like data.task and others in separate libraries. So if you go to Folktale, she put them all in one repo called Folktale, Folktale 2.0. And by the way, that's me, you know, Jesse Warden, duh. I'm at Jester Excel on Twitter. If you've got any other questions about this video or other things, obviously my YouTube channel, and you can send me an email as well. People on Twitter who've helped me a lot in functional programming, Bodil, she helped me a lot to know the path to success, which is something like Folktale, then learning the language like Elm, and then finally PureScript. Once you do that, you're ready for things like Elixir and Rust and Haskell. 
Claudia Dopo slash, she's really cool around Erlang. She answered some of my questions about Elixir, and she posts a lot of really neat and hard to understand sometimes functional stuff. Quill, or Robot Lolita, she works on Folktale. She's been extremely patient with me on GitHub as I'm trying to learn this stuff and trying to help and contribute back, and she's a very effective writer. Uh, I've never reached out to her on Twitter, but on GitHub, she's been extremely professional and patient and helpful. Dr. Bullion, he's the guy, also sometimes known as Dr. Frisbee. He wrote, uh, did a really famous presentation about Lodash, you're doing it wrong or underscore wrong or something like that on YouTube. And he's done a, a very interesting but awesome egghead.io set of tutorials on functional programming. And lastly, Swan Nodet, this guy's blog is awesome. Uh, not all his posts are still out there, but this guy is actually a closure guy. And he really helped me out answer some basic questions a long time ago around functional programming as well. And I'm not a list fan, but you know, getting out of my comfort zone, they, they still think about some of the th same things that we do in functional programming. So he's a great guy on Twitter to follow as well. I wish I could go back 18 months and start off by watching that Elm video, even without the ability to code Elm. Just I want to learn about functional programming. The, the One of the guys who gives this Elm talk in this YouTube video I linked to, it just really gives you the basics in a very effective easy to understand way. So if you're looking to learn just functional programming, don't worry about Elm in general, just read, watch this video. I thought it was wonderful. And lastly, if you're looking a way to, you know, practice this stuff and get your hands dirty, you don't have any project ideas. If you take an existing library in JavaScript, you already wrote and install Bodle's ESLint config at the bottom. It's amazing. It took me three and a half days or two and a half days to get a code base to work with it. I was, it was great. Like it was so hard. I hadn't had programming that hard in so long. I really had to think outside the box and read stuff and low dash dot. It was crazy. So definitely definitely a fun thing to do. So again, my name is Jesse Warden. I hope this helps. If you got any other questions, hit me up. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. And I hope this was helpful. Thanks. Go check out Folktale. It's really fun.